If there's one series I'd say is overlooked nowadays, one collection that I grew up with for its better entries and its worse ones, if there is one group of films that is so emotionally deep as well as visually stunning, it's the Expendables series. I'm almost out. I'll be back. You've been back enough. I'll be back. Yippee-ki-yay. Oh wait, no, it's the Planet of the Apes trilogy. That's right, we're back to talk about the Talking Monkey movie. No, not Zookeeper. We're talking about Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. This series is genuinely beautiful, a trilogy focusing as a character study not only on the main character, but as a character study on humanity as a whole. This is what the original film does so well, holding up a mirror to the aspects of human society that are not so uh, uh, great. However, this trilogy does not only this, but recontextualizes the worst and the best humanity has by showing it at a very extreme time, the end of itself. So I'm continuing a new quest, a quest to see why do I really like this trilogy, but not only this, why is it really, really good? Go ahead and watch the video on Rise of the Planet of the Apes that we made last month, as I'll be referring to things that we talked about in that video, from the plot to the characters to the themes and all, all that stuff. So without further ado, let's jump in. So Rupert Wyatt, the director of Rise of the Planet of the Apes, declined to direct this film, saying he didn't have enough time to make the film with the original locked release date of May 23rd, 2014. And of course, that lock date was moved, so he didn't even really need to leave. Go figure. Well, at the very least, the director brought on board for the film was Matt Reeves. Hot off the heels of Cloverfield and Let Me In, Matt came in and read the original screenplay that was set further in the future, with the apes having obtained the ability to speak almost flawlessly, and Caesar playing a much smaller role. He asked to rewrite the script, and the studio basically said, look, if you can get it out by our not-so-locked date, then whatever, man. And from there, the production went on for 91 days, pretty much unencumbered by any random uh, problems, besides, like, some camera equipment malfunctioning from, like, being in a rainy rainforest area. In terms of production, though, they shot most of the uh, motion capture stuff out actually out on external sets, like the Ape Village, and man, can you really tell. But here are some other things you should probably know that I may have forgotten to mention in the last one. The orangutan that's named Maurice is actually named after Maurice Evans, who portrayed the Dr. Zalus from the first two movies. Caesar's son is named Blue Eyes after the fact that he is the first of the new generation of apes born without the ALZ 112 or 113 changing their eyes color. And the book that Alex gives Maurice is called Black Holes by Charles Burns. And uh, the, the story is a fantasy that kind of is an allegory about STDs uh, among American teenagers that turns them into outcasts. Sound familiar? It's like being a monkey. Anyways, let's talk about the plot for those who haven't seen the movie in a while. Almost a decade has passed since the global outbreak of the ALZ-113 virus, and with most of the human population being dead, the ape population has thrived and grown. This is shown with a beautifully haunting series of newscasts, which is usually a lazy way to do exposition, but just watch it yourself. It's not. Anyways, Caesar and the apes are hunting in the woods from the last film. During the hunt, Caesar's son, Blue Eyes, is suddenly attacked by a bear, getting marked on his chest. That way we can tell who he is more easily. His Lieutenant Koba hears Caesar's call and kills the bear with his spear, saving Caesar and Blue Eyes. Caesar thanks Koba for his help and tells his son to think before he acts. The apes return to their awesome looking sanctuary that has a school and even individual homes in it. Caesar tends to his sick wife Cornelia as she gives birth. Afterwards, Caesar talks to Maurice, basically saying he thinks about humans despite not having seen any for two years now. But now it's time for the inciting incident. So Blue Eyes and his friend Ash, Rocket's kid, are walking through the woods when a human named Carver encounters them. Carver shoots Ash, and after that sound, the other apes, as well as the humans that Carver is traveling with, led by Malcolm, go towards the gunshot. Caesar commands them to go, and the people are like, 
Whoa! As they leave, and Caesar sends Koba and the two other chimps to follow them, Malcolm and the others return to their camp in the ruins of San Francisco, reporting to their leader Dreyfus on the group of apes and Caesar's ability to speak. It's revealed that a hydroelectric dam is up near the apes and that the humans are about to lose power without it. Koba sees where the people are and reports back to Caesar. There's chatter about going to war, but Caesar says no, so instead the apes ride into the city on their horses and Caesar declares that the apes do not want war, but they will fight back if they must. They return Alex's bag and Caesar tells the humans to never return to the forest. Dreyfus tries to reassure the people in the camp and afterwards Malcolm tells him that he can convince the apes to let him fix the dam if given just enough time. Dreyfus agrees and gives Malcolm three days to complete his task or he'll just go up there with weapons and take them all out. Malcolm prepares himself to go out and his wife Ellie, a nurse, volunteers to go with him. He wants her to stay home with Alex but Alex overhears and just decides to join them. So Malcolm and his group of extras travel back to the woods, Malcolm entering the sanctuary by himself. He is captured by gorillas and taken before Caesar. Malcolm explains that he means no harm and shows the apes the facility with the power systems to prove his intent. Caesar allows Malcolm to work on it only if they give up all of their guns. Malcolm agrees and the apes break the guns apart. Koba approaches Caesar and expresses his distrust for humans because of the experiments performed in the Gensis labs, leaving him with multiple scars. Caesar, however, sees this as a chance to make peace with the humans. The humans set up a camp in the woods and around the campfire they talk about the apes. Carver addresses Malcolm and Ellie as they have each lost someone close to them from the virus, pissing everybody off in the process. And in the morning, Caesar and the other apes prepare for another hunt, but Koba is nowhere to be found. Koba and two other apes travel to the city where they come across a supply of weapons for humans to use against the apes. Koba is found and pretends to be a playful chimp in order to not be discovered. And the motion capture here is hilarious. <laughs> Malcolm, Carver, and Foster are working in the dam, and after a small explosion clears out some blockage, the blast temporarily traps them in the tunnel. The apes rush over after hearing the sound, and Ellie is able to convince them to help. They leave the dam to treat their injuries, and the apes sort of hang out with them. Obviously, everybody feels a little bit closer now. Caesar's baby goes over to the humans, playing with Ellie and Alex, and when the little ape goes over to the box containing a gun, Carver reacts, seizing the weapon and aiming it at the apes. Caesar grabs the gun from him and whacks him with it. Malcolm manages to calm him down just enough for Caesar to only throw the gun into the river, ordering the humans to leave. However, Malcolm doesn't give up. They need this electricity. He and Ellie find Caesar in his home with Cornelia, who is getting worse. Ellie offers to aid her with her antibiotics. Caesar gives them one day to stay to help his wife and finish the damn work. Foster, one of the extras, I don't know if I introduced him yet or not, forcefully takes Carver back to the truck and leaves him there, taking the truck's keys so Carver can't run off. The humans return to the dam and when Koba comes back to warn the other apes of the human's weapon supply, he sees the apes working for the humans and nearly attacks Alex. Malcolm protects him and Maurice steps in and defends them both. Koba says Caesar loves the humans more than he does the apes. Enraged, Caesar attacks Koba, beating his face until he decides he cannot kill him. Ape, no kill, other ape. Koba extends his hand to Caesar for forgiveness. Caesar accepts, and Koba leaves immediately. So Koba returns to the compound to find the same two men from before. He once again plays up the funny monkey act. With their attention diverted, Koba grabs one of the rifles and kills the two men, leaving with that gun. On his way back, he finds Carver sitting in the van, and Koba beats him to death. Cutting back to Malcolm and his group, they have successfully reactivated the generator, and there's a sweet scene at the gas station with all the lights on, and then the music's playing, and oh, it's it's nice. It's a, it's a nice little reprieve before, you know, act three. So Caesar shows them the lights turning on in the city, and it's revealed that Cornelia has even gotten better. And just when everything looks great, Koba appears with the rifle, only visible to Caesar, and, not expecting this portrayal from another ape, Koba shoots Caesar. He falls from the village top as Koba flees, leaving only the rifle and Carver's cap which Blue Eyes comes across. Maurice tells Malcolm, Ellie, and Alex to run as the other apes become enraged. 
Koba tells them the humans killed Caesar. He rounds up all the males and charges into the city as Malcolm and his family hide. The humans are celebrating the return of their power and Dreyfus checks his iPad to see pictures of his wife and his two sons, who have since been dead and probably the best crying I've ever seen in a film. Not like, not, not, not like in a weird way though. He checks the control room where another guy is trying to contact anyone else through the radio. Suddenly, Koba and his ape army ride into the compound to lay siege to the humans. Dreyfus gathers a group to stand over the gates and fire at the apes. He grabs a rocket launcher and blows some stuff up as Koba manages to charge through the gates and break down the human wall. By daybreak, Koba and his followers have taken human prisoners. Koba comes across someone with his group of apes, who is barely managing to fight back, and Koba orders Ash to kill that man. However, Ash shows mercy, saying Caesar wouldn't want this. So, Koba grabs Ash and throws him off a balcony, killing the ape. Meanwhile, Malcolm and his family find Caesar barely alive. They take him away and he leads them to his old home in the city. They try to treat his wounds as the apes run through the city with the human guns. Blue Eyes sees the apes that refuse to follow Koba are in cages, and Maurice tells Blue Eyes to protect himself. Since Ellie needs medical supplies for Caesar, Malcolm goes back into the city via the subway system to get them, narrowly escaping being killed. After getting the supplies, he runs into Blue Eyes, who holds his gun up to Malcolm, but cannot bring himself to shoot him. Seeing this, Malcolm takes him to Caesar. Caesar tells Blue Eyes that his being shot was Koba's doing. Blue Eyes fills Caesar in on everything that has happened, and a plan is formed. Later that night, Caesar goes to the attic and finds an old camera with a video of him as a young chimp, with Will teaching him the concept concept of home. Caesar notices Malcolm watching him. Caesar tells him that the person in the video is a good man. Meanwhile, Blue Eyes initiates the plan and Maurice and the other trapped apes break free and break the humans out. The apes find Caesar and tell them about Koba's plan to get the female apes and young ones to join him and together, along with Malcolm, they head out to stop Koba. Koba and his followers have gathered at the top of a tower, and it's revealed that Dreyfus and two other men have made contact with the military and are loading the base at of the tower with C4. While Caesar and his friends go to face Koba, Malcolm encounters Dreyfus and the men and steals a rifle to stop them, trying to convince them not to go to war with the apes. Dreyfus refuses, saying he is about to save the human race. Caesar and Koba fight around the top of the tower, and as the tension in both areas heightens, Dreyfus activates the detonator, causing an explosion that kills him and the two men, and causes a lot of damage above, killing a lot of the apes. Malcolm somehow escapes the blast, and Koba once again tries to rally the apes, but there's some hesitation. Caesar continues fighting Koba until in the chaos, Koba takes his gun and shoots at the apes. Caesar dives in and tackles Koba, knocking him off a ledge. As Koba hangs on for his life, he looks up at Caesar, who pulls his arm up. Koba tells him, ape not kill ape. But Caesar looks down and replies, you are not ape. You are not ape. He drops Koba and allows him to fall to his death. The surviving apes, including Caesar's family, come up to the tower and reunite as a group. Malcolm warns Caesar about the incoming military reinforcements that would start a war, saying the apes should leave. Caesar says that an ape has already started a war, and it wouldn't matter if they left. The two of them acknowledge their friendship, but also the fact that the chance for peace is gone. Malcolm leaves with Caesar standing over the apes, all bowing to him once again. And at the end of the closing credits, the sound of howling apes and the scraping of rubble can be heard. All right, that was the plot. Now let's get to the juicy characters that we have here. So I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about Carver since he's sort of just someone who's afraid after everything that's happened. And it's not that I think he's uninteresting or anything. It's, it's just that I think Dreyfus is similar enough to this while being a bit more compelling. Again, Carver functions well in the plot, and he's not just a one-note asshole. He does have his reasons for being so mistrustful. But again, I want to look at Dreyfus for a study on one aspect of what fear produces. A little bit of background. Dreyfus used to be a police officer, even becoming the chief of police in San Francisco. Under his tenure, he caused crime to drop year on year and even took down three major crime bosses. Oh wow, he's literally Commissioner Gordon. He was married for 20 years and had two kids during this time. Dreyfus was a model citizen. And then, 
Monkey Gate happened. Side note, apparently the Golden Gate Bridge incident from the last movie was called Monkey Gate in this universe, and that's awesome. Anyway, by the time of Monkey Gate, he was running for mayor, and after many incidents of chaos increasing due to the viral outbreak, he eventually was elected mayor. And at this time, he realized that his family had contracted the virus. After 10 years or so, he met Malcolm, and the two of them became leaders of a small community, bringing us to the start of this film. With all that backstory out of the way, I want to look at the defining characteristic of Dreyfus in this film. It could be misconstrued as something like selfishness, but I, I don't think that necessarily covers it. After Dreyfus loses his family, he operates solely on fear. But this is not the kind of fear that paralyzes you. This is the kind of fear that prevents you from objective rationale. And without getting into whether a human is capable of objective reasoning, We'll just say that objective reasoning is reasoning based on an available evidence without regard to small-scale emotional persuasions. And I mean small-scale as in individual preferences, because large-scale emotional preference would be something like, it's obvious that to prefer your own survival or those of your species is based on emotions, since without their assumption there's no reason to not prefer death. Since, you know, death uh, allegedly does not include suffering. But anyways, this is what Dreyfus suffers from. He's clearly able to think ahead as he sends Malcolm to the forest for the power, but sends others to where the military aid was left to get ready for a war. And while we could argue that because nobody sends word that Malcolm and the group are working with the apes, Dreyfus has to assume that the likelihood of them succeeding is low, I, I think the point is that, it, at least by the end, he doesn't fundamentally want to save the remaining people but rather have revenge on the apes. This level of fear moves beyond the irrational and becomes full circle rational, just without reference to needs outside of your own. And the reason this is so interesting is that we can all relate at least a little to this feeling of being so afraid from what's happened to simply trust again. It causes you to overlook the good and become mesmerized by the bad. However, this is not a certainty, and we find this in the character of Malcolm. So backstory on Malcolm, he worked as an architect in San Francisco where he and his wife lived happily for many years. Eventually they had a son, Alexander, and when Alex was five, his mother contracted the simian flu and died, leaving Malcolm to raise the boy alone. As Alex grew up, Malcolm grew more distant from him, not knowing fully how to be the father the boy needed. And within a decade, he remarried after meeting Ellie, a nurse who had also lost her family to the simian flu. See, Malcolm represents the more noble side of suffering from fear. Or maybe more accurately, the more noble response to fear. See, Malcolm's relationship to his son is exemplomatic of the fear that Dreyfus holds from losing his family, this causing their emotional separation. But the difference between the two characters is that Malcolm recognizes this failure and is seeking to change that. Malcolm emphasizes trust with everyone that he can, and even when someone breaks that trust, he doesn't react hatefully to them. It's Malcolm who seeks out the apes after their show of force, trying desperately to work with them, not against them. He sees the best in others, being an optimist who is just not naive, but is instead choosing to be this optimist. One can say that Malcolm is doing this specifically because he didn't lose his entire family like Dreyfus did, and maybe that's correct, but that's kind of the point. Malcolm moves on, not from the feelings this trauma has caused him, but from the fear it left him with. These two human characters are so interesting because of this, the duality of a response to fear. And while we can apply this to most of the characters, humans and apes alike, this is only one layer of analysis. Because, like I said in the previous video, this series is full of religious illusions. Speaking of which, now I think it's time to talk about the central dynamic between Koba and Caesar. So Caesar has been the leader of this ape colony, the only one that they know of, for about 10 years, where after the bridge fiasco of the last film, Koba became a trusted friend. Koba, being loyal to the apes though, may not have loved the apes as much as he resented the humans. There's a running idea throughout the series that Caesar does not think lesser of humans over the likes of his own kind, and that this is most likely due to his upbringing 
showing him the best of humanity, with Koba's multiple years in laboratories showing him their cruelest side. And this difference forms the basis of how they would act in this world, Caesar wanting to just live freely and Koba wanting revenge for all apes and himself. Over the course of the film, this rift between them widens into a chasm, eventually having Koba betray Caesar and Caesar having to kill him just to bring peace even just momentarily. This calls to mind many other stories of betrayal, but there's one I think is more emblematic of this than others. I think these two characters are actually retelling the story of Cain and Abel. And to be fair, this could also be the story of Saul and David if you switch some things around and change the motivation. It, it, it kind of works, but again, I think the Cain and Abel story works better here. So in Genesis 4, we see the story of Cain and Abel. They're the first two sons of Adam and Eve, and through their day-to-day -day tasks, they are expected to offer a sacrifice to God, and through doing this, God tends to favor Abel's sacrifice. Cain gets angry at this and tricks his brother to go out to the field with him. Cain kills Abel and God, upon finding Abel's body, sends him away, making Cain a fugitive from the earth. Cain is marked by God so that nobody will kill him and then somehow, Cain marries another person and starts a city where essentially everybody there creates culture and technology and this all culminates with those people apparently taking matters even further than what God allotted for Cain. So that last part is actually interesting because as I said in the last video, myths are a way to explain the world around us and, and here we see the first murderer basically starts the secular world and this leads to those who take revenge in a way that far surpasses a righteous punishment from God. Now that doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about, but I wanted to give that a mention because that's kind of interesting. No, the part we're focusing on is why Cain killed Abel. See, Cain kills Abel because his sacrifice is not pleasing to God, but why this is is a mystery. It could be that Cain is not offering his best and God knows it, or maybe it's as simple as sometimes your best is just not up to snuff. Either way, the point is that lashing out in anger does nothing for you, and there is an alternative solution to when life arbitrarily does not go your way. And this lesson is retold in the film. Koba tries to kill Caesar because of Koba's hatred for humans leading him to turn on the more peace-seeking Caesar. From the beginning of the film, we see Koba and Caesar's bond, Caesar trusting Koba enough to save him and his own son. The bond there clearly goes both ways, but as the film progresses, we see this bond dissolve into antagonism based solely on how to deal with humans. Cain kills Abel because his sacrifice is somehow lesser than Abel's, and Cain cannot see why this is. Cain refuses to confront this problem, so he turns to premeditated murder. Koba tries to kill Caesar because he cannot see why all the humans should not be killed. He refuses to confront this problem and finds himself committing premeditated murder. By the end of the film, when it comes to blows, Caesar condemns Koba, telling him that he is no ape, meaning he has lost the bond that brings their kind together. He is cast out, literally removed from his kind, but whereas the Bible says this kind of person is where all the things that are bad come from, this film states that this kind of person simply cannot exist with you and will inevitably need to be destroyed. This sounds dark, I know, but consider the myth. The myth describes the world as it is through a narrative, and what this particular myth describes is not what should happen, but rather what does, or maybe even what always will happen. This is the dawn of the new world, after all. And at the end of the day, in this new world, I suspect that the separation between the consciousness and the animalistic nature of a person it's a lot closer than it was ever before. And maybe that was a bit existential, so let's end on something a little less out there. Dawn of the Planet of the Apes being the first film in the entire franchise to be shot on digital, used an RE Alexis camera, a camera known for an amazing color science, showcasing very, I guess, real? Tones is the best way to describe it, maybe? But boy is it clear here. Every shot is steeped in this naturalistic color, a moody gray that doesn't appear like the gross color grading done on Netflix films. Michael Saracen, known for shooting this and its sequel, as well as Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, and Step Up. Huh. Okay. Anyways, the cinematography on display is a class act up there with the greats. The use of shadows to give layers and dimension to the environments as well as dramatize the presentation aspect of this dramatic story. I mean, he truly went all out for this piece. But then there's the direction. 
Matt Reeves is one hell of a director. Look at his past works from The Batman to Cloverfield to the remake of Let the Right One In titled Let Me In. This man knows how to direct. And without getting into a scene analysis and without giving the actors too much credit because we would hate to do that, I want to briefly look at how the scene where Carver's gun is found and how this really helps us to understand how Matt Reeves directs. So the humans are tending to Carter and the camera changes focus to Malcolm in the back. The audience asks an astral question, what is he thinking? And the answer comes to he's going to give a sincere thank you for the ape's help. While this happens, Caesar's newborn ventures off towards the humans. The audience asks the natural question, what will happen with him? There's an initial tension as the child interacts with the humans, but very soon it becomes an innocent and sweet moment. Carver is on edge, but otherwise the scene is just a pure example of the relationship the apes and the humans can possibly have. Every main member gets a spot in the scene. And then the youngest ape approaches Carver's toolbox uncovering his gun. So Carver explodes, shooing and yelling at the ape. Blue Eyes yells, pushing Carver. Carver pulls out his gun, but as suddenly as he pulls out the gun, Caesar throws him down, and he is about to beat Carver to death with his own gun as Malcolm pleads with Caesar not to do it. Caesar lowers his arm and takes up the arms, pointing it at all the humans. Caesar decides not to kill Carver, but he takes up the arms, pointing it at all the humans. The audience asks, what is Caesar about to do? So Caesar throws the gun into the nearby lake, taking his newborn in his arms and telling the humans to leave for good. And, that, and that's more or less the scene. This scene is a good example of how the film by and large functions. The scenes are structured in a way where a question arises from a decision that a character makes, and as soon as that question is answered, a new one becomes apparent. The characters in the scene drive the plot as they make active decisions. This on top of the way that the scene is directed, with each character having many emotions to run through during the course of the scene, makes for a compelling viewing. And perhaps I'm not really able to put into words exactly what I mean, but the point is that one way to keep the audience's attention is to have multiple questions one may ask during the course of a scene, answering them in a natural and interesting way with only a minimal amount of randomness demanding a character reaction, all while utilizing effective blocking and camera work. And all that's to say this is why the movie is so compelling to watch. It demands your attention. It is the opposite of passive viewing. It's the opposite of lazy filmmaking. But don't worry folks, if you still haven't felt the call of the Planet of the Apes, there is still one more film left in this trilogy to discuss. One more film to examine the new world. One more film to explore the desperation that a loss of control creates. One more film to explore the character of Caesar, last name Monkey. Because in the next film, there will be war, and it will be brutal. But that's for next time.